Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture on causality. Today we will talk about the Duke calculus and possibly it will be a little bit shorter lecture. So let's see. It also depends on how much questions you have or how many examples I can come up with to play around with the Duke calculus. So we are still following the book of um, Jonas Peters and colleagues. However, today we will be mostly in Pearl's book, Causality. So since we are talking about the Duke calculus. Um, Last time we looked at covariate adjustment and today we will look at the Duke calculus. I think we won't talk about total effect, direct effect and indirect effect. I think that we will do some at some other day. So today we again look at the problem of calculating interventional distributions and an interventional distributions is one where we have where we condition on a do operation. So basically at a manipulated distribution. So this cannot be observed directly if we observe x and y by watching the world, we get only the probability distribution of x comma y or possibly also y given x or x given y, but never something with the do operator. So the do operator is really about manipulating the world and changing something and then observing whether the x has an influence of the y. Okay, so and now last time we looked at different tricks, the adjustment formulas, and we will go over them again in a second. Yeah, where we had formulas to calculate such an expression with a do operator from probabilities without do operators. Yeah, and the goal of the do calculus that we will look at today is to manipulate these kind of expressions to get rid of the do operator. So, um, let's again look at some examples why that might be a difficult problem. So for this let's look at the first simple example. So we have a super simple causal graph. X is the cause and Y is the effect. Okay. In this case of course if we intervene on X we said we need to chop off all the incoming edges from the X. Right. So we would manipulate the graph to get the interventional graph. However in this situation there's nothing there's nothing gets modified. So in this case X doesn't have any parents. And so for that reason, P of Y given do X is exactly the same as the conditional distribution. So whether the X comes randomly from some P of X or whether the X is manipulated, the Y is always generated according to our structural causal model in this case, depending on the value of X, right? So in this case, um, the do operator just disappears and it turns into a conditioning. So setting a value is the same as conditioning on it. Um, however, if we have like a common cause, like in the um, smoking causes cancer problem, where we, for example, would say there might be a gene which we cannot measure, which is outside our scope of observations, but it's influencing both of the both the cause and the effect. In that case, um, intervening on X will modify the graph because we have an incoming edge for the X, and so if I intervene on X, so set X to a particular value, this edge disappears. And now we cannot simply replace the conditioned on do x by conditioned on x yeah, because um, we will get something else out of this. So if we would do that we get this um, we could replace this by the summation rule introduce z and then using the product rule we get this expression okay and there we see that we kind of averaging these mechanism P of Y given Z and X by a probability distribution Z that depends on X. Okay. However, if I change the value of X, I'm not really manipulating the Z. So I'm only manipulating the X, but the Z is just changing its value as before. So having here the P of Z given X is definitely something that is wrong if we want to calculate the do X. So this equality does not hold in this case. We look at this in much more detail in a second. So the thing is, why is that wrong? Because X and Z in this case are independent variables. So the Z shouldn't depend on the values of X. However, I also, if I would omit it over here, then I would just have the adjustment from, from last time that we've seen last time. So let's continue with the example. So we have these two graphs. This is the structural causal model. And this is the one where I intervene on the error. And we said that it's wrong to equate it with the condition. However, what can be done is, that we um, basically also introduce the variable Z here and having the product rule. So we get P of Y given Z in the manipulated graph and P of Z in the manipulated graph. And in that case, 
we know that it doesn't matter for the y whether we manipulate the x or whether we just take the value of the x here because it's like conditioned on so we plug in a particular value in here and for the z we know in the manipulated graph that it does not depend on the x so we can just remove the due operator and we get the adjustment formula as before so this is like a different derivation of the adjustment formula okay so far so good um, so we are playing around with these things and we are looking maybe for some real rules one when can we remove such a do expression when can we change the do expression into a usual x expression and this will be all in the do calculus um, let's continue again um, in the, in the wrong formula, basically, the problem is that the z still depends on the x. However, since there's no edge anymore, it should be independent. And in this case, we would also call the set where we sum over the so-called adjustment set for x and y. So this is also the definition for the so-called adjustment set. So if this equality holds, then set z is an adjustment set. These probabilities here, they all come from this structural causal model where we didn't intervene. So those are observational distributions here coming from the joint distribution that has been generated from the graph on the left where there is a connection from z to x. So having the graph on the left hand side, we cannot replace the p of z given x. We can only derive that if we are in the manipulated graph. In that graph, we can derive this formula, but not for the left hand side graph. OK, um, maybe let me, let me reiterate this. So um, we have in our observations are all coming from this graph, okay? So this graph is this graph is used to to generate some big table of whatever x, y, z, okay? And we have this big table, and from that one we might be able to estimate the p of x comma y comma z, the joint distribution, right? So this is all observations. And they might be available to us. Maybe this is even available to us. When we have z1, we, we also have p of x comma y, and we would have p of x given y, and so on and so forth. All these different variations they follow from the joint distribution. Okay? So if we have the joint, we can we also have all the other distributions. So in particular, we have p of y given x and z, and we have also p of z given x. And this one is not equal to p of z right in our observation world so this is one setup however now we are talking about an experiment about an intervention and now we are asking so what can we say about the probability of y given do x now this is a different probability for which i have a different graph and the, the graph is now almost the same but now this edge here it's chopped off so this is now no longer there because in in this distribution now or in this world with the do x i've kind of replaced this graph by the graph where i chop off the incoming edges so that's a notation for that one which you introduce in a second so i chopped off these ones and now here's a joint distribution is different. Here the joint distribution would be p of x comma y comma z and let's say I'm I'm manipulating it with x0 okay and I could also use this notation p of do sub x0 and so for this one I'm now having a different joint distribution and it is having the same terms for y and z but a different one for the x so it is still the p of z right no incoming edges and it's still the one p of y given x comma z however for the x now i'm having in this case iverson brackets asking whether the x which is this one is equal to the x zero where i put it a particular value so this is now the joint distribution i'm interested in so this is what i can observe and this down here is now the question that I'm asking is, so what is P do, let's say x0, of y? Can I get an expression for that one in this graph? And here it turns out one can derive that this is the same as summing over the z, and we get a P 
do that. I'm now using the notation from Peters. Py given that, and here I'm having the p do. Ah, not z z zero x zero, and here I'm having the x zero of the z, and then I can conclude. Okay, if this is the joint distribution, then the p do for x zero of y given uh, y and z comma x. Ah, where do I get the x from? Uh, okay, it will be an x0 um, that now I can replace it basically with p of y given z comma x and p of z where these ones are now from my observational distribution. Does it make sense? Okay, so there's the stuff that I can observe and I have a certain joint distribution and then I have my intervention. And so this probability that I'm interested here is in a different setup. And for this one, I can make a manipulated graph. For the manipulated graph, there's a new joint distribution. However, some of the terms are the same as before. And basically, I want to rewrite this using only terms that I have already from my observations. OK? OK. But um, feel free to ask again if there's something that could be clarified. So let's have a quick repetition of this valid adjustment stuff. So um, basically, a set of variables z is a valid adjustment set yeah, for my variables x and y if it allows me to do this trick calculation. Yeah, then z is a valid adjustment set. OK, that's just the definition. And we've seen some examples. For example, the set of parents of x that is a valid adjustment set. And that can be seen from this formula that if I would sum over all the parents of x, yeah, then, for example, I have a valid adjustment set. Um, however, in, in this situation here, um, it means I need to observe the parents of x. So in order to use this formula down here with the p of z and the p of y given z comma x, I, I need to observe the z. Okay? So they must be part of my observations. So if I observe all the parents of x, then I'm fine. Then I can just use these um, distributions here on the, on the right-hand side, which are only observational distributions, to calculate a probability distribution for some different environment where I'm basically having a manipulated graph with a manipulated distribution for the x, in this case being constant. Okay. So. Um, in this case, okay, this is just notation. I think this is all fine. Um, of course, how do we find out who are the parents of x? For this one, you need the graph, okay? We always assume here that we have the graph, and then we can make these kind of statements. Um, there's another possibility for an adjustment set, and that was the backdoor criterion. So that was another set z, which is closing all backdoors. So visually, instead of kind of um, manipulating a distribution over here, yeah, when I chop it off, it could be that there's another variable, whatever, e or something, and that one would be also fine. If I can observe the e, I don't have to observe the, the z. So that's another possibility for a valid adjustment because it's closing the backdoors, the backdoors that go from x to y. And the backdoors are those connections from x to y where I'm starting against the arrows, okay? So those are the direct connections, and here's like a backdoor connection from x to y. And then we define a set of variables closes all backdoors. If none of the node is a descendant of x, okay, fine. And if z blocks all paths that go like through the back, okay? And then we could say, um, if we have a set that closes all backdoors from x to y, then this set, set is a valid adjustment set, and we can use it, OK? So this is just a repetition of what we did last time. Um, as I said, the parent adjustment is one possibility that fulfills the backdoor criterion. So the parents of x fulfill the backdoor criterion. However, it always depends on what variables are you observing. Um, there's also a statement uh, that they call toward necessity in the Peters book, and they have an if and only statement about the statement that z is a valid adjustment set for x and y. 
So and they can say if Z contains no descendant of any node on a directed path from X to Y, except for descendants of X, blah, 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 and Z blocks all non-directed paths from X to Y. If Z is fulfilled for Z, then Z is a valid adjustment set. And one can show that all valid adjustment sets fulfill these two criteria, and if you have another set that fulfills these criteria, it is a valid adjustment set. And when you look at the definition, it's a quite technical one. So let's go through it in a little bit more detail to see whether we can make sense out of it. So we're talking about x to y. So this is a directed path. And basically, in a causal model, we are typically interested in the effect that goes along this direction. So we now want to calculate p of y given do x. So if I manipulate the values of x, how does the y change? There are different possibilities. So there could be some parents of x, right? There could be several of them. But the parents could also have other, other parents, and so on and so forth. There could be some complicated structure on top, maybe like this. So all different possibilities. Uh, those are not all possibilities. Those are some possibilities for paths. So there could be these backward paths, which start with an, with an arrow pointing outward from the x. And then there's the directed connection. And the problem is that somehow I need to block all these upward parts, and that is called adjustment. There are also some connections down here, so there might be more than one directed connection to Y, but there could be also nodes, uh, whatever, let's say H, where basically both are going down, or maybe even further G, no G, I have already, so let's say J, so which are like down, uh, descendants of x and y simultaneously and everything could be even more complicated so let's again look at the definition so valid adjustment set was two things so the first thing was um, or let's start with the second thing adjustment set let's start with the simpler one set that should block all non-directed paths all non-directed paths from x to y. OK, those are directed paths, so we can ignore those. This is a non-directed path, right? However, that one is blocked by observing nothing, right? If we don't observe the h, and if we don't observe the j, then this path between x and y is blocked. Right, because this is a V structure. So that is fine. And another non-directed path are the ones, the back doors up here, which are basically starting, yeah. for example, with an error that points into X. Question? Yeah. No question? Okay. So which basically starts with an error into X. And the Z, the valid adjustment set should block all these Path. And that's like similar to the intuition we had for the vector criterion. The first point is a bit more involved. So it says Z contains no descendant of any nodes on a path directed from X to Y. So let me, Z contains no descendant of any node. Um, on a directed pass from x to y. So what does that mean? Um, those are the direct, this is the directed pass here, okay, and there might be some in-between node, k for example, and the k might also have another one, l, another descendant, and the z is not allowed to contain any of those. So it should neither contain the K, of course, but also not such a node. Um, why is that the case? Because if it's containing such a node, it will manipulate by adjusting for it. We will have at the end something like P of Z, or it was P of Y 
given x comma z and summation over dz. The problem might be that if I condition also on a node like this in the p of z, then this will manipulate the in-between distributions of nodes. I sorry. Yes. Can you uh, show the uh, whiteboard or the the slide? Yeah. Oh, didn't I show the? Oh, sorry, I showed this stupid. Ah, okay, I looked at the wrong one. Okay, so let me repeat. So you were all looking at this slide for all the time, most of you, right? You only seen the people who have the video could see me drawing. Okay, let me repeat. What do I want to explain here? So we are still at this formula, and this is the formula for Z being a valid adjustment set. And there is a theorem towards necessity which characterizes all possible valid adjustment set with two points, which are somewhat complicated, and you might only understand them or get an intuition for them with drawing a picture. Let's look at this picture first. So I have X and Y. Those are like the key players, and I'm interested in how the X is influencing the Y. And there are directed paths from X to Y, and maybe possibly more than one. And then there are undirected paths from X to Y. For example, down here, where basically from both, I'm descending to some other nodes. That's also a path from X to Y, however, not a directed one that follows the direction of the arrows. And then there are also these backdoor paths. From our intuition, um, it was already clear that the Z must close all the backdoor passes, right? That's like the story from last time. And that is basically the second point. Z should block all non-directed paths from X to Y. So, for example, you could observe the Z or the G, and that would be fine to block the paths if you include the Z or the G into your adjustment set or valid adjustment set. Um, another non-directed path is maybe via H, However, that one is always blocked if you don't observe the H or the J, right? So such as that is a V structure and is, the path is blocked if neither the H nor any of its descendants is observed. Then this path is blocked. Otherwise, you have ex effects like explaining away. Now, what about the first point? So that sounds a bit more complicated. The Z must not contain certain nodes. It must not contain any nodes on the directed path from X to Y. For example, it must not include a K, like this one. It must not include a descendant of the K, so neither an L. And why is that the case? Because it, on the, along the direction, the probabilities should kind of freely flow exactly like in your observational distribution. However, if you condition, for example, on the L, yeah, with this expression down here, you're kind of manipulating also the distribution of the K, and then you are changing the effect. So. It's valid adjustment set if it doesn't interfere with the directed connection from X to Y and if it's blocking basically the backdoor pass. So that is kind of the expression for that one. Okay, let's flip back to the slides. Um, here are a couple of more nodes. So one can be seen to be more general than the, the first point of the backdoor criterion. Yeah, so it, it could be this is more strict in a way, so there are more things. So it's okay if you only, rec so the vector criterion is more easily fulfilled the first point than the first point over here. Okay, I disagree, blah, blah. Okay, fine, so that is, and the second point is also more general as the second point in the vector criterion, so it includes more cases in this case, okay? So far, so good. Um, then last time already we looked at the question Okay, adjustment set is one strategy, kind of blocking the backdoor pass. Are there other strategies? And the answer is yes. And we had the front door criterion already last time, and we looked at it, right? So what was the front door criterion? Um, it is another way to control, basically, the information flow from X to Y by controlling some in-between variable and kind of having some double summation. That was a little bit involved. Um, and the formula was very different from the normal uh, adjustment formula. However, now the question, of course, is in more generality, um, are there even further criteria? So there's the backdoor one, there's the uh, valid, uh, the, the towards necessity adjustment formula uh, criterion, and there's the frontal criterion. Are there more? And one can show that the do calculus that we will explain in a second can derive all of them. Okay, so that is like the most complete description of to manipulate these kind of expressions. 
just as a repetition, the frontal criterion was something, if you cannot observe the back doors and control them, you have to control the front doors and you have to kind of make sure that you know what's passing from X directly to Y. So that's like the, the approximate story. And for that one, if we have such a set Z that is kind of controlling the front door, we have some other formula, which is a double summation in this case, where we introduce um, over all possible values of X different from the one where we set it to and also the one where we set it to. So averaging over those, we can kind of replace the the term that goes through the back door by some term that goes through the front door. Last time we, we derived it. Um, however, note that this set Z, if it satisfies the front door criterion, does not satisfy typically the back door criterion. So it's something else. It's really something else. Okay, so let's get started with the do calculus. So now to quote Perl, the, the do calculus now, uh, okay, what does he say? So let me quote him exactly. In applications involving identifiability, the role of the do calculus is to remove the do operator from the query expression. So let's first ask, so what is a query expression? An example of a query expression is this one. Calculate the probability of a certain random variable given that I manipulate something. So that is a query expression and identifiability refers to the case so the value of a query expression is identifiable if I can derive another expression where there's no do operator. Then we say this query expression is identifiable and I can calculate it from purely observational data. Okay, and so the do calculus has exactly this role of removing the do operator from a query expression to make it identifiable. Um, so the starting point is a formula or an expression with do operator. The goal is a formula without one. So let's first take at a glance. So this is the do calculus. And at first it looks a bit overwhelming because now here are four different sets of nodes. We have a graph and we have quite complicated setup of things. And we have quite complicated statements with another notation with some graphs where we chopped off edges. We derive now this theorem 10.8, like hand wavily a little bit, step by step, by first starting with something which is much simpler, but which has a very similar structure. So for that one, let's first introduce the notation for the graphs. So suppose I have a graph G yeah, with some nodes. Now we write G sub X with a bar on top of the X, meaning the same graph as G, where we remove all incoming edges for the set of X. Okay, so X could be a subset of nodes or it's one of the nodes. And if we draw a bar on top of the X, it's like chopping off all the ones that we have so, uh, that, that are going to X. So as an example, uh, we had already an example for that one. So this is the graph from the beginning, okay? And if this is the graph G, we can say the graph G sub X, where we chopped off all the incoming edges, that's why it's on top, is the graph where we basically removed all the parents from X, of uh, the incoming edges, okay? So this is the, the graph G X. Of course, now you can already guess what is this graph? So that is the graph where I'm cutting out all the incoming edges. Uh, no, where I'm cutting out all the outgoing edges from X. So it will be Z. And then I'm having Y and the X. So in this case, I removed that node. And in that case, I removed that, uh, that edge. And in this case, I removed that edge. OK, so those are the, this is the notation. And the X can, of course, be a set of things. And I could also have uh, something like whatever, GX bar, Y bar, blah, blah. So I can have whatever I want, right? And notice that the order doesn't matter, right, in which I chop out the edges, yeah? It's about removing edges. So why is that an, a useful notation? Because then I now can talk about my observations. from a, They came from a probability distribution like that. And my do setup where I, for example, talk about do x, 
Yeah, then I'm talking about this graph where the edge from z to x is removed. Okay, so it's a very clever notation from Perl. Okay, so far so good. Here are further examples. So this is a figure that I copied from the book from Perl. Suppose this is our initial graph. It's the one from the smoking example, I think. Um, so we have some unobserved you know, uh, variable u and we have x, z and y with this structure. Then there's a graph called g sub z where the z has a bar. So where I chopped off all the incoming edges for the z, which is just removing the connection from x to z. And notice it's the same graph as chopping off all the outgoing connections from x. So in this example, the gz cut on top is the same as the gx cut at the bottom. Okay. Here's another example. Here basically for x and z, all incoming edges are removed. Here are the outgoing edges of z removed. And for this last example, the incoming of x are removed and the outgoing of z are removed. Okay, so this is a very clever notation, talking about like these graph, graph cuttings. So far so good. Okay, it's still intimidating. It's still a large set of variables here. Let's simplify it. Okay, so let's first look at the simple case. So here's the super simplified version of the do calculus. Let's look at the different rules and let's Think about them, why they make sense. Okay, suppose now we have some joint distribution P and a causal graph G. So here's the first rule where I got rid of all the clutter. So P of Y is equal to P of Y given Z if Y and Z are independent. Okay, and that's something that makes sense, right? So I can in include a new condition in a probability statement if this new condition is independent of the variable I'm talking about. Okay, so that is the first simplified rule. Let's flip back to the true rules. So how is it similar to this one that we see up here? So basically, if you get rid of the w and the do x, so the w and the do x on the other side, then we exactly have p of y given z is equal to p of y. Okay, and a similar statement could be made for the, for the rest here. But we keep that for later. Okay, so that is the first rule. So basically, if a, y and z are independent, yeah, we can omit a condition like z, right? That's for trivial reasons. Let's look at the second simplified rule. So under what conditions can we add this do in front of a variable here? So when is the conditional distribution p of y given z equal to p of y given do z? And that is the case if y and z are independent yeah, in my manipulated graph. Or I could also say y and z are de-separated in my manipulated graph where I chopped off all the incoming outgoing edges of z. So let's think about that for a second. There are a couple of thoughts. So in my g sub z, I, I can also draw a picture on the board. So maybe that's more instructive. So let me just check what I had. So we are talking about p of y given z. And I'm asking, when can I change the condition to a do thing? We know already, if the graph looks like this, for example, yeah, then it's the same. Conditioning on z yeah, is the same as putting it to a particular value. So that would be an example. However, of course, here z and y are dependent. In this situation, it should not work, right? In this situation, if I condition on the z, it's something else than setting the value of z to a particular value. Because if I condition on z, also the y changes its distribution in my observational distribution. However, if I put this to a particular value, it's not influencing at all the y because it's going against the arrows. Okay, so in this situation, the rule holds. In this situation, it does not. So the key here is it always holds if, so this rule is implied if the y and the z are independent in a particular manipulated graph. And it is the graph where I chop all the outgoing connections of the z. So let's see what's happening, whether it makes sense for these two cases. So 
in this graph, for example, I would chop the outgoing edge of Z. And in that case, Z and Y have no connection anymore, right? And they are then independent. And so it makes sense to say that they are equal. So I'm looking for a deseparation or independence in a manipulated graph. And if that's the case, then I can introduce this do operator in here. What about that one? That here's a manipulated graph would chop out all the outgoing edges of Z. However, in this one, Y and Z are not independent, right? They are still a connection. So here it doesn't hold. So in this case, we cannot apply this equality. In that case, we could apply this equality. However, let's look at it a bit more detailed. So we have the Z arrow Y. So this is our graph G, fine. There might be other nodes, right? So there might be some uh, whatever. There might be some. So um, the thing is, uh, look at this. So we always check the deseparation. And if the deseparation holds, then this equality holds, right? And so in, in this graph, so th if this is the graph G, yeah, then the G sub Z is just the same because there is no outgoing edge. And then the Y and Z are not independent, so this doesn't hold necessarily, at least not via this reasoning. However, now let's look at the other case, which was more interesting. So we said we have the G now, Z, arrow, Y, but there might be some backdoor up here, right? So if I draw the G sub Z, in that case, the outgoing edge is gone, but the incoming edges are still there, right? And so in this situation now, um, it would mean, so this means that the Y and the Z are not deseparated in this manipulated graph because there's still a dependency that goes along the top path. So in this situation, in this situation, I'm not allowed to use this rule, which also totally makes sense because we learned that this guy over here can be calculated via the, some adjustment formula. So we need to observe the A kind of, and we need to include that one into our formula. So if there is a backdoor in this one, yeah, then we shouldn't use this formula. So how does it work? Basically, if y and z are independent in this manipulated graph, yeah, the only way um, how they could depend would be between such a backdoor. But this statement is saying there is no backdoor, right? So if I chop off all the outgoing edges from Z, there might be still incoming edges of Z, but they should not create a dependence between Y and Z. Or going back to the slides, if there are connections between Z and Y in the manipulated graph, yeah, those connections must be backdoors because I chopped off all the outgoing errors. However, if I'm assuming that the Y is independent of the Z, yeah, so there cannot be any backdoors. Otherwise, they cannot be independent. Okay, and if there are no backdoors, okay, I can calculate the effect of intervention using conditioning. So everything is fine. Okay, maybe one thing that might be confusing here is the the way I wrote things up or the way people write down the calculus. So let me write it like this. So y independent of z. Uh, and let's say in G sub lab implies this one. So that is the second rule here now, okay? So this is the, um, the premise. So this, if this holds, then we can apply this calculus formula and then we can just put a do in here as we want, okay? So far so good, the first and the second rules we trust kind of right? Are you fine with them? Yes. If no one says no, I'm assuming you are fine with it. Okay, let's look at the last one. So we had that we can introduce a Z yeah, as a condition. Then we had that we can modify a Z to a do Z yeah, and thought about some reasonable way to think about it. And here we have the situation that we can condition on a do Z or not. Okay, so let's look at the last one. So the last one it says, if y and z are independent in the graph where I omit all the incoming edges for z, 
Okay, it means there cannot be any directed path from Z to Y. Okay, let's think about it. These things are quite tricky. So let me write it down as well. So the third condition looks like this, Y and Z in G, where I'm having the incoming edges. In that case, I can say P of Y given blue Z is the same as P of Y. Okay, so that is the situation. So now let's start to think. So the first thought here is, if I have this independence, there cannot be a directed edge from Z to Y. So let's think about that one. So suppose there is some directed edge from Z to Y, some directed path. Then Y and Z cannot be independent in this graph, right? I mean, there are my, maybe these connections, and this manipulated graph gets rid of a connection from a back door. However, it does not get rid of connections that go directly from Z to Y. However, I'm assuming that Y and Z are independent, right? So there cannot be any front door connection. And if there's no front door connection, it doesn't matter whether I manipulate the variable Z or not. The distribution does not change, not even by conditioning or something. It's just that the do Z is not changing the Y. Even though there might be a connection like this, I'm not saying anything about that one, right, because I'm chopping them off. Um, I still can introduce a do operator here because the do operator is only working along the direction of the error, so it cannot work backdoors. Okay, so far so good. Okay, that's the first thought. So there's no directed path from Z to Y, and there might be backdoors, but that doesn't matter, right? We can just introduce this do of Z because it's only for the front for the front directions here. So far so good. Are you all happy with these three rules now? Kind of. So we now have these three simple rules. So if they are independent in the graph, I can condition or not. Doesn't matter. Okay. So that's equal. If Y and Z are independent in the graph where I chop off all the outgoing edges, then I can change a Z into a do Z. Okay. And the third rule is if Y and Z are independent in the graph where I chopped off all the back doors, right? There cannot be a direct connection. Then I can also just put in a do of Z in, in there. So those are three reasonably simple rules. Notice that they generate a cycle, right? So P of Y is equal to P of Y given Z. P of Y given Z is equal to Z1. And Z1 is equal to Z1. So it's like going once round. So it looks like run rule is not necessary. However, notice that the conditions are different, right? So for the first one, we need the statement that independence in graph G. And for the other ones, we, need, we have independence in some other graphs, OK? However, there's an easy exercise yeah, that one can show that rule 2 and 3 imply rule 1. And since it's an easy exercise, I want to show it to you, OK? So let me um, uh, okay, erase it. But let's put the three rules. In a, in a good form to the board, okay? So I, I try to put them by by, head, by my head now, but not sure whether I can do it. So uh, first of all, let's put the condition. So Y is independent of Z in G implies that P of Y is the same as P of Y given Z. Okay, that's the first rule. Now comes the second rule, it's P of Y and Z are deseparated in G, where I chop in the, let me do it right, right away, where I chop in the outgoing edges. And that implies that a condition on Z can be changed into a condition on do Z. Right? OK. 3, Y must be independent of Z in GZ, where I chop in the incoming connections. And in that case, I can omit a do Z. Now the statement, or actually it's a, it's a lemma, and it was proven in some paper, which I, I think phrase there, is that uh, rules two and three imply rule one. Right? So if I can show that. Um, so to prove such a statement up here, I could use 
P of y is equal to z1, z1 is equal to z1, and z1 is equal to z1. However, the only challenging thing is here with the premises. So that's something to deal with. So that's a question. Um, okay, uh, I guess it's about this, this one, right? Is there, or could you ask it in, in words maybe? Very good question. So let's make this more precise. So, okay, this is very clear where everything is defined. If I talk about P of Y and these expressions, those are all probabilities for my graph G, right? However, this one, that's actually an expression uh, on a different graph, on the graph where I chopped off the incoming edges, so where I'm looking at this graph. So if I have something with the do operator of Z, I'm looking at a different distribution. Or in the notation of Peters, so that would be P of do, uh, no, P of do Z, like this, okay? So they are not talking all about the same graph. So those are the manipulated ones, okay? I hope this answers your question. Okay. So. Now, this is the thing I want to prove. I want to prove that rules two and three, if I only have those two, I can already have the, the first one. <clears throat> How can I prove this? So to prove this implication up here, I need to assume that, um, oh, let's write it out, assume y and z is independent in G. I assume that, and then I show that p of y is equal to p of y given z, right? So this is something I want to show, this equality. Assuming that one, I need to prove this one, right? Everything's fine, everyone's fine with that one? Okay, if I can show that from this statement, my assumption of rule one, the assumption of rule two and three is implied, then I'm allowed to use my calculus here and I'm having immediately the result, right? So the only thing I need to show is that y in, 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 uh, deseparated from z in g implies y and z is also deseparated in the manipulated graphs, okay? Now, this can be seen by saying um, in z, uh, g sub z bar and similarly g sub La. Well, let's first take the first one. So G sub Z, where I chopped off the outgoing edges, has fewer edges, edges, or arrows, than, than G. So if I have a deseparation statement in G, it must also hold in G sub Z, right? because I even removed a couple of edges. So if something is deseparated in G, it's also deseparated in any of the subgraphs of G, right? Why? Because deseparation is defined as a statement about all possible um, paths from Y to Z, right? And if I'm getting rid of a couple of arrows in my graph, the number of paths can only decrease, okay? And so if this statement is for all connections from y to z in g, true, that the everyone is blocked, then also every path in my manipulated graph will be also blocked. And similarly, the same, um, okay, or let's first do that, so it has fewer edges than g, and thus um, the y and the z is independent in g as well, where I chop off some of the edges. And similarly, I can also show that y is independent of or deseparated from z in, in the other graph where I chopped off some other edges. Okay, this guy also has fewer edges than g, so there are fewer paths to check. So a deseparation in g always implies a deseparation in these subgraphs. So, with other words, if I have the assumption, the premise of rule 1, it implies the premise of two and three. So if I have that one, I'm allowed to use 
the second and the third transformation. And if I have those two, I have the first one. Okay, so that's it. That's the whole proof. Okay, I wrote it down very shortly. So now if you would write it down, for example, in an exam, of course you would say, okay, so I'm allowed to use whatever rule two and three. And then you use it and you show that P of Y is equal to Z1 and Z1 is equal to Z1 and we're done. Okay? So far so good. So we've seen that rule two and three imply rule one. Okay? And this is well known. So there's a paper from Huang and Valtorta. It's called Pearl's Calculus um, of Intervention is Complete. And in Lemma 4, they are exactly proving this one. Okay? By the way, Pearl's Calculus of Intervention is Complete is a nice statement already. So that's a paper title. It basically means in this paper, they, sh they can prove that these three rules or the more general versions are really complete in deriving all possible um, expressions that you can have for terms that involve the do um, operator. Okay, so far so good. So where are we? Our goal was to understand Perl's do calculus, which looks intimidating, is quite complicating. So far we are happy with um, three rules that we just derived. And we found out rule one can be derived from the other two. Okay, that's an interesting statement. So let's get closer to the true Perl calculus, okay? So those are the three simple rules we've just seen and they don't have any condition. So let's add a condition, right? Here we just add a condition on W to all of the rules. So far so good. So all of the piece, the statements here, they just are now conditioned additionally on the W, right? That's fine. There we just manipulated the distribution a little bit. And for the independent statements, we also have to condition on the W, right? Because we are now talking about a manipulated distribution. So we are still in the graph G, but now if we are talking about P of Y given W, we need to talk about the graph G, but additionally we are conditioning on W. So if Y and Z are conditioned on W independent, yeah, in that case, of course, I can remove the Z. However, if there is no condition on W, possibly Y and Z are not independent and I cannot do it. Okay, so far so good. So the first rule is quite simple. The second rule is also quite simple. It's just a, a variation of the previous one where I now condition on the W. However, the last one now, it looks a bit, it looks almost the same, but there's a little detail now. There's this Z of W in here, which is now somewhat more complicated than the Z that we had before. And that's something that actually takes a little bit to understand. So what is this Z of W? Z of W is the, Z, is the, is the same set as Z. However, where I remove yeah, all the nodes from Z that are not ancestors of W. Okay, so if I have the set of all ancestors, I could write it as a set difference. I have a set Z and I remove all the elements in the ancestor of, of W. So this looks a bit technical and that's a confusing rule. So that requires some more explanation, okay? So let's try to understand this Z of W, why it's required. And we won't fully understand it, but I give you an example. If it doesn't, if it would be just Z, I show you that we would derive something wrong, okay? So first of all, the reasoning is similar. First of all, note the Z of W is a subset of Z, right? Because Z is a set difference. So I'm removing some of the nodes from Z. Okay, so ZW is really a subset of Z. Fine. That means the G sub ZW has more arrows than G sub Z, right? Because Z is a larger set. A larger set meaning I'm removing more incoming arrows. Z of W is a smaller set. It's a subset of Z. So I'm removing fewer incoming arrows. Okay, so that is the first reason that we have to do that. The G, that W has more arrows than GZ. That's the first thing to understand. Fine. Thus, if we have a deseparation statement in the, in the graph with more arrows, okay, 
then it also implies the same deseparation statement in the graph with fewer arrows for the same reason as before. If I have a graph with fewer arrows, in that case, basically I'm having removed some of the paths, so my deseparation that I have before will be also valid in the other one. However, in this graph G sub Z, there might be even further deseparation statements, yeah, which are not there in Z of W. Okay, so we're going step by step. So if now in rule three, the um, premise over here, this one, oh, I can't mark it, I don't know why. So if the premise here is fulfilled, so I am having a deseparation statement that Y and Z are deseparated given W in my manipulated graph, then it also is the case for G of sub Z, right? Because this statement at the back here is also implying the same statement as G of sub Z, okay? So far, so far so good. So now the question is, why would be asking for deseparation in G sub Z too much? So it would be nicer from the optics, like, and from simplicity, if, if that would be just G sub Z. And now the question is, why would that lead to a wrong result, okay? And um, for that one, we would need to find a little graph, a little example, where we have an independent statement in the graph that has fewer arrows, yeah, but where we don't have the independence in a graph with more arrows, okay? And then we show that this rule of removing the D of Z is wrong in one case, but not in the other, okay? And by Z, we show that the Z is wrong and the Z of W might be correct. Yeah, we haven't proved it correct, but we show that the Z is wrong and the Z of W is better. Okay, so let's look at the example. So this is the example. And the example is simple, it's just this graph, Y, error Z, error W, that's it. So let's apply our reasoning. So first of all, we need to say, okay, Y and Z are independent given W in the manipulated graph. Okay, let's do this on the board. So the graph is Y, Z, and W. And we are talking about rule 3, where rule 3 says um, Y and Z should be deseparated given W in the manipulated graph. And one option is in GZ, and the other one was Y and Z are independent in the Z of ZW, where Basically, I'm removing from that all the ancestors of W, okay? So now, let's check our statements here. So first of all, note that the graph Z, G, Z. So this is my graph G. Let's draw the graph G, Z, bar. So that is the graph where I'm removing all the incoming edges to Z. Okay, so far so good. So this is one graph. And this is another graph. So in this manipulated graph, all the incoming edges for Z are chopped. So now, by just by looking at it, Y and Z are now independent. So they are independent of that one. So we can have a check. OK, so great. Check. So this statement is fulfilled. Let's draw the other one, Z of W. So in this case now, um, we need to think about what is Z of W, okay? So the Z of W is Z without the ancestors of W. So W is here and the ancestors are the one where I'm going against the direction of the arrow. So Z is an ancestor, Y is an ancestor. So the Z of Z without the ancestors is just the empty set, okay? So there is none. So that means, in this case, G of Z of W is equal to my graph G. Okay, so far so good. Now I was after this rule 
whether I can, I think it was P of Y given do of Z, comma W, and it should be equal to P of Y given W. Let me check it whether this is what I wanted to check. Yep, that's the one I wanted to check. Okay, so for that reason it's wrong. Okay, let's repeat this on the board, the reasoning. Our starting point is the graph G. And we have a manipulated graph G sub Z bar, which is that one. And we have another one, G of Z W, where the Z of W is the empty set. So the graph stays the same. And now, one can show that, okay, maybe we can show that Y is independent of Z in my manipulated graph, but Y is not independent of Z in that graph. So Z was maybe missing. So actually I'm not allowed to use rule three, right? However, if that would be the condition, the premise of rule three, if that would be the case, then I could derive P of Y um, is equal to P of Y given W, which is a wrong statement. Okay, so that is the reasoning. So far so good, so far so confusing. It confused, then maybe we are fine. So the question was, um, let's remove this one and that one. So the question is the rule three, so we are talking about rule number three. Why do we have this condition here with the ZW, which makes it more complicated, and why don't we have the nicer version with the Z bar, okay? So here's a counterexample where it would be wrong if we would have that condition. Because in this graph, we have the independence, so we would be allowed to use this rule three. However, according to the actual rule three, we are not allowed to use it because they are not independent in the manipulated graph. If we use it, we get a wrong statement because we would say that the P of Y given W would be equal to, um, P of Y, which is a wrong statement, okay? So according to rule three, we have this equality, and then looking at this graph, if I'm looking at the distribution for P of Y in the do Z manipulated graph, then basically I'm getting the same one. But P of Y in general is not the same as P of Y given W. Okay, so far so good. It is confusing. So far so good? I hope so. It is a bit complicated. Oh, you have another question? Maybe not right now, but if you have, please ask in the chat. So where, what have we done now? So we've done now, we talked about going from the super simple rules, which kind of are easy now when you look at them, to a more complicated set of rules where we condition on W and we get this technicality of having to change the subset where we chop off the incoming edges. And there were quite a couple of steps to go through the reasoning why that, that makes sense to remove that. And if we don't do that, we get a counterexample of rule three, okay? So um, let's talk about something else. Does the order of the do calculus matter? So does it matter whether we write P of Y given W given do X or the other way around? In this case, it doesn't matter. However, if we have counterfactuals, everything gets a little bit more complicated. In particular, we have to be um, a bit careful with the do notation. So if we write the expression P of Y given do X comma Z, if we would apply now this product rule, it looks like P of Y comma do comma Z in this one, and that is the wrong statement, okay? This is not allowed. So this conditioned on do of x is not like having another random variable. So you are not allowed to use the product rule for that one. What is allowed is to put the do expression to the back, okay, they must be actually, ideally they are on the very right side, and then you can apply the product rule for the random variables that are in there, but not for the do of x. So that is just a shorthand notation, which is very useful, but which might lead to wrong statements like this. So in this case, both sides use the manipulated distribution or the manipulated graph in this case. Okay, so far so good. Another way, maybe a reason why 
in the Peters book, they're using a different notation. There it might be more clear that the distribution is manipulated by do of x, but the do of x is not like yet another random variable I'm conditioning on, but it's like a, another way to write it. Okay, so with that in mind, let's get back to our three simple rules so far. They're already with condition, and now let's add another one. Let's add also an intervention to make them fully general. And so how are we doing this? Basically, now we put everywhere a do x in the back for the probabilities. So now we are choosing different probabilities here. Of course, since we are talking about different probabilities, we also need to look at different graphs. So now all the graphs that we have up here are now replaced by g sub x, where the x has all the incoming edges removed. Okay, so the do operator, putting it everywhere in here now, leads also to all the graphs removed. And this is now the full do calculus. That's it. Okay. So the steps are first to start without condition, without intervention. Then you start and add the condition, yeah, and have an additional explanation for the z of w why it's there. And then having these rules accepted, you can put the do x in the bag as well. And that is now just a trivial change to the setup. Um, so. At first glance, this looks quite complicated. However, if you don't have a do x in your expression, you can get rid of the x here as well, and it gets simple again. OK, so here is the full do calculus. Um, notice the first rule is also called insertion or deletion of an observation, right? Because you have an observation z, and you can remove it or delete it. Or going from the right to the left, you can insert it. And you can always apply this rule if the premise is true, where the premise is now a statement about a deseparation in some manipulated graph. OK, the next one is we exchange an action to an observation and vice versa, right? So that's another description of making a do z to a z. It's like exchanging an action statement to an observation statement. Under certain conditions, that is allowed. And basically, it means that all backdoors from z to y in the blocked in this graph where I chopped off some of the edges are blocked by x and w. And this statement basically follows from the discussion we had for the simple rules for rule 2. And the third one is insertion and deletions of actions. So you can sometimes also add an action do of z to your probability statement, where we had this z of w special case that we discussed just a second before. OK? And this is now the full do calculus in all its, in all its glory. Um, now one can show, and we don't show it, um, but there is a proof for that one. I think it's a one-page proof, which is super dense. OK? And the, the statement is, one can show um, that all the formulas for causal effect can be derived with the do calculus. So if you have a statement um, which has a do expression on one side, so if we have something like whatever, and it could be also more complicated, and we can derive something where there's blah, 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 and here are no do's, so without do. Yeah, so if such a um, statement can be transformed into a statement without do, yeah, in that case, it can be derived with the do calculus. Okay, so the do calculus can derive all these kind of equations. And that is called a completeness statement. It's like in logic, where in logic you have a calculus, and you can prove that in first order, uh, the first order calculus can derive all true statements. So if a statement is true, it can be derived in with a certain calculus. And the same holds here. If there is a true statement, it can be derived by the calculus. However, you need another one, the soundness theorem, which says the do calculus does not derive anything that is wrong. Okay, And if we have both, then basically you know that the calculus expresses all the possibilities that you have. Um, if you want, I can point you, please ask me in the chat if you want to have the link to the paper for the completeness proof. It's super dense. 
However, if you would like to write a master thesis on that one, that would be quite curious to work it out and to nicely write out the completeness and soundness proof of the do calculus. But it is quite challenging. But if you like graphs and if you like these kind of manipulations a lot, that would be a really nice master thesis. So um, as an example of the do calculus, in Pearl's book, he derives basically the front door criterion using the do calculus. So that can be done. However, the example we gave last time is much easier. Yeah? So to derive it like super general, it's quite complicated. So we won't do it. Instead, let's look at another example. Let's look at a very simple one. Um, so let's look at the um, very simple example if we have x error y. Okay, Then basically we have that p of y given x is equal to p of y given do x. Okay, so let's start with that example. So that's already difficult enough for us. And basically we want to use rule 2, where rule 2 is exactly the statement p of y given do x is equal to p of y given x if we have a certain independence, if x is independent of y in some particular graph, okay? And in order that I don't mess up now, I think I, it should be independent in the graph where the, uh, the outgoing edges of x are cut. But let's check that one. So let's check rule two. So action observation, I can change an action into an observation, right? If they are independent in the graph where I chop off all the outgoing actions of the z, uh, outgoing errors of the z, okay? So basically I need to check if I want to apply this rule, so to prove this statement, I need to check that x and y are independent in this manipulated graph. Okay, so this is the graph G. Let's draw the graph G sub x. That is the graph where basically all the outgoing edges are chopped off, okay? And if I'm independent here, then I can do this. Okay, in this graph now x and y are lonely, there are no connections anymore, so they are independent or deseparated in this case, okay? So then the statement holds and everything is fine, right? So let's check the same statement, but the other way around as a second example. And now we know that typically they are not the same anymore. So this premise should be violated in the manipulated graph. So the outgoing edges are gone, but the incoming edges, they stay the same. So the manipulated graph looks exactly like the one before. And in this case, x and y are not deseparated in g sub x. So we are not allowed to use this rule. Okay? So this is a very simple application of the do calculus. So far so good. Are you happy with the example? More or less. So here are a couple of pictures from Perl where one can show with the do calculus that something is identifiable. So this means now, how is this read? So here are seven examples. So for example, there's the error from x to y, okay? And we are always asking the question, what is p of y given do x? Can we calculate it from pure observations? So in terms the first statement, p of y given do x is exactly equal to p of y given x. That was the example from the board. The errors, they don't look so nice here on my, on my board here, but I think you can guess where the errors are. So this is another example that is identifiable. Where now here we have this double arrow, which basically means there is a confounding variable on the side, okay? And also in this case, the do calculus uh, can be used to derive an expression for p of y given do x from only observing x, y, and z. And also in the other more complicated cases. And they're getting quite non-trivial, like this one where you have a lot of um, confounding happening so that is very non-trivial to identify an expression for that one. However, with the calculus, you can do it. Then there are some non-identifiable models. Non-identifiable means 
there's no way to use the do calculus to get an expression for p of y given do of x. So this is a typical confounding example, the one, for example, with smoking causes cancer, without having an in intermediate variable here, but having a confounding variable that is not observed. And in that case, we don't have an expression for p of y given x. And similarly for the other example. However, it, it gets quite involved. So sometimes you have an intermediate um, variable like z1, but then there are some weird backdoors or some weird connections. And you cannot derive an expression for these situations here. So they are non-identifiable. Okay, good. So far so good. However, we are not going into a detail or deriving any of those. Now you might think, so will it be an exam question that you need to derive for one of those, the right expression? I think that might be, so apart from the super simple ones, it's too difficult to do this, I think. So it's good to be aware that these kind of mechanisms exist, but I think it's too challenging to derive these things in an exam. Good, so far so good. Any questions? If not, then I think we are at the end of today. It was quite involved. I also got quite confused, as you've seen on the board, but I hope at the end everything was clear. So thanks for your attention, and I will see you um, I think it's a new year for another lecture on causality. Okay, bye-bye.